Good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming today. Um, my name is Kenning Arlich. I'm the Dean of the Library at Montana State University, and Scott Young is our user, uh, user experience and assessment librarian. And Carl Benedict is also in the audience. Wave, Carl. Carl is the uh, Director of, data, of Research Data Services at the University of New Mexico, and he was a co-author on the um, research that we're going to present to you today. So uh, it's no secret that we are deep into our surveillance society. I don't know if anybody saw this article yesterday in the New York Times. Um, your apps know where you were last night, and they're not keeping it secret. Uh, it's a very interesting article. This is not specifically what we're going to be talking about today. We're just going to be talking about websites. Looks great, doesn't it? <laughs> Did you want to show more from the internet? It's just because it's in this. presenter mode. Okay. 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 Um, There's a great the article in the New York <laughs> Times, <laughs> and it is called "Your Apps Know Where You Were Last Night, and They Are Not Keeping It Secret." Uh, published yesterday. I'll switch back to the presentation now. <clears throat> so, as I said, we're not talking specifically about apps today, but we are talking about. A, um, an audit that we conducted on academic library websites to determine whether we're actually living up to the privacy and security principles that we like to espouse. Um, so uh, we'll cover, um, Scott will we'll start talking first about third-party tracking and web analytics, and then talk a little bit about our, uh, the privacy principles that we, that we do um, talk about in, in numerous different forums and from numerous uh, professional organizations. And then I'll launch into the actual uh, research that we conducted uh, for this audit and the results that we came up with. And then we'll, we'll make some recommendations for how to improve things. Um, and then we have at the end some uh, discussion prompts that hopefully will lead to uh, some more conversation. So Scott, we'll start. Hello, everyone. Uh, so again, I'm Scott Young, a user experience and assessment librarian at Montana State. Uh, Kenning's reference of the New York Times article is, is a useful one because it kind of shows how, how compromised we all are um, in surveillance and third-party tracking, because the New York Times itself is one of the greatest offenders of news publishers. They have the most trackers of any leading publisher, um, th so they ask for the most data, um, and, and they're not very transparent about it. So it's quite rich from them in particular. Um, so for third-party tracking, some of you are, are really familiar with this. Um, for the rest, we just want to instill just the right amount of fear in you um, to prompt action, but not so much that you feel paralyzed. Um, so third-party tracking. Um, Web analytics services, that's what our research focuses on. Um, so it measures how people um, use our websites. Um, information through these trackers is sometimes passed to other trackers. Um, and this happens often without the fully informed consent of users. And we say fully informed because a lot of us have some consent, some informed consent, but do we really understand the full extent? So that's what we tried to study and that, that's what we're trying to talk about today. Um, and when we say users, we mean, of course, the people who visit our websites, but then ourselves as well. Um, do, do we understand the, the extent of it? Um, the practice of third-party tracking um, on websites is really widespread, um, and it's increased in prevalence, variety, and complexity over time. Uh, the trackers, the cookies, for instance, um, were pretty simple about 10 years ago. They're extremely sophisticated now, and they can talk to each other. Um, there's a vast network of trackers that share data so if there's one tracker has a little bit of you in one context, it can match up with trackers that are in another context to build a complete profile, and then a version of your digital self is sold and traded all across these trackers. So there's a picture of you, your sort of digital self out there being bought and sold. Um, so libraries, we are a part of this. Um, we are, we're partnering with third-party vendors that, um, that play this game. Um, so Google Analytics was a focus for us, but Really, any sort of e-resource vendor, this is an issue for them. Um, one that comes to mind recently was a browser extension called Lean Library, um, which promised to connect users seamlessly with the resources but they were a private company and they asked for a lot of data. Um, so, 
these third party companies, they might not share our values. So it's hard um, for us to operate in accordance with our values when this software that we use um, doesn't really care about that so much. So we're just gonna jump right to the end here. Um, things we can do. Um, for Google Analytics and web tracking or web analytics, we can use a different service. Google Analytics is, is an obvious one, but there are at least two others um, that you could look into. Matomo, previously Pwik, and then there's one called Open Web Analytics. So just take a look at those, see if they can work for you. Um, if you do want to use Google Analytics, um, configure the IP anonymization setting. Um, this is a configuration that is built into Google Analytics. Turn it on. Um, it, it obscures a little bit of, um, uh, of your user information. And then you can implement opt-out mechanisms to your website, um, help users um, uh, turn off tracking, uh, and then use HTTPS. Um, we've been talking about this in libraries for a little while, but um, as our research showed, not a lot of libraries have actually implemented this, so we're here to say it again, HTTPS. <clears throat> so just a quick overview of Google Analytics. It has some benefits. We know this, it's free to use monetarily. Um, it's easy to install. Um, it's extensive and sophisticated. It has a lot of charts and graphs, which are really fun and helpful. Um, and it can provide useful insights, it can. <coughs> but of course, on the other side of the ledger, there are costs. Um, it passes user data to Google. Um, it may not align with our values in terms of privacy and intellectual freedom. Um, there are inaccuracies in the tracking. We know this as well. There's other research that Kenny and others are on to try to understand accuracy in web analytics reporting, but that's a really difficult task. Um, and as a result of that, it can produce dubious insights. So it's hard to say sometimes what you're looking at um, and how to build actionable um, responses to Google Analytics data. So we collect lots of data through these third-party vendors like Google Analytics, but we as a community can lack, have a lack of understanding for the technology. Um, and we don't always appreciate its privacy costs. So that was sort of our, our starting point, and then we wanted to put some empirical data on this. Um, <clears throat> and more of this background is our privacy principles. This, I'm sure you all memorized, but we will go over it again, because it's very important. NISO says, libraries, publishers, and software providers have a shared obligation to foster a digital environment that respects library users' privacy as they search, discover, and use those resources and services. IFLA says, library and information services should reject electronic surveillance of any type of illegitimate monitoring or collection of user data. <clears throat> These are strong statements. They're good statements. Uh, ALA says that the right to privacy is the right to open inquiry without having the subject of one's interest examined or scrutinized by others. And CNI has a statement Libraries collecting data using Google Analytics are realizing that they may be violating the ALA Library Bill of Rights. Um, this is just one example of how easily convenient web-based service offerings can come with unexpected consequences. Michael Zimmer a few years ago did a profession-wide survey where he found that 97% of librarians agree or strongly agree that libraries should never share personal information um, and share personal information. That's the point of that quote. So um, we, we have these guiding principles. Um, we, we say we want to, to live these values. Um, so, so how are we doing that? How are we doing that? Um, we know that privacy has long been a concern of libraries, but given the extent of third-party tracking, it is really difficult to implement analytics trackers like Google Analytics without compromising the privacy for users that libraries have long championed. So if there's one diagram that can kind of summarize this, it might be this one. On the one hand, we want to show our value. We want to understand our services. We want to improve our services through Google Analytics. Um, and then on the other side, we want to live our values. Um, and sometimes these, this is a site of tension for us, um, understanding what our values are, but showing our value at the same time. Okay, so let's dig right into the research. Um, this is the article that was published in Online Information Review just a couple of months ago, and I'll show the, the um, citation again at the end. Um, as they said, we, we conducted an audit of library website homepages um, to, to, to try to find out if we were really living up to those principles that Scott was just showing. 
So we had two major re research questions. The first was, do libraries implement HTTPS, and this is important, with proper redirect practices in place? Um, you can implement HTTPS, but if an insecure uh, request comes in and you're not directing that insecure request to a secure request, uh, to a secure fulfillment, um, then you're, you're still not really utilizing HTTPS very well. And then the second question was, uh, do libraries that use Google Analytics implement the available privacy protection measures? And this is something important to emphasize. Yes, Google Analytics has its problems, but there are features built into it that can be implemented, can be turned on, and we wanted to know uh, to protect privacy, and we wanted to know whether libraries are actually doing that. So a little bit more detail on these two um, research questions. Um, the first one about whether uh, libraries have implemented HTTPS on their home pages. Um, so specifically, we wanted to know if they protect privacy with a secure connection between the user's browser and the library's website. Um, do they use a permanent redirect to enforce that secure connection? And do they sometimes um, <coughs> defeat uh, the implementation of HTTPS by redirecting to an insecure connection. Even when a secure connection comes in, do they sometimes redirect to it an insecure connection? And then a little more detail on the second research question. Um, first, we wanted to know how many of the, how many of the libraries in our sample use uh, Google Analytics. Um, do those libraries protect user privacy by implementing that secure connection between Google Analytics? and Google's, uh, or, or between the library's web servers and Google Analytics uh, servers at Google. And then there's also an IP anonymization feature that is built into Google Analytics. Has that been turned on? So these are the questions that we wanted to ask uh, through our uh, audit. So the methodology we employed, uh, Webometrics is a subset of a much larger uh, uh, set of research methodologies known as infometrics. Um, scientometrics, bibliometrics, cybermetrics are all part of this, smaller concentric circles. Um, and Webometrics was initially developed in the, I think about in the 1990s, and focused on statistical analyses of words and phrases. But more modern definitions also take into account um, resources, uh, technologies, and infrastructure on the web. The specific method that we use uh, could be classified as a social sciences uh, research method called uh, covert observation. And this is where you basically watch a participant without them knowing that you're watching them. Well, of course, here we weren't watching people. We were simply checking for the presence uh, or lack of presence of certain technologies on websites. In social sciences, covert observation research has sometimes um, has sometimes run into ethical problems. But again, here we weren't we weren't looking at people. We were just looking at whether a certain set of uh, technologies and implementations were available on public websites. So we're totally ethical. <laughs> Um, so here's our study population, 279 U.S. and international academic libraries, which included 16 countries. Um, the study population had to have a membership in one or more of the following uh, organizations, the Association of Research Libraries, OCLC Research Library Partnership, and or the Digital Library Federation. So that's how we came up with 279 academic libraries. So to our... Wow, this is cool. <laughs> this is what happens when you switch from one computer to another. And I apologize. All right, so what's your guess? <laughs> yeah, 60 40 is pretty close. So, about of our pool of 279 academic libraries, 62%, or 173, had implemented HTTPS, and 38% had not. We'll go to the next non-value. <laughs> um, then we asked the question, of those 173 that had implemented HTTPS, how many of them had implemented an appropriate redirect for insecure uh, requests to a secure fulfillment? And the answer there is, Oh, you're looking at the article. 
<laughs> right. Only 32% had, had implemented those redirects. Um, then we asked, oh, and I should also say, um, and, uh, okay. In, uh, then we asked uh, research question two, how many um, research libraries had implemented Google Analytics? Guess. Some, I've got a ringer out there. 88% of us have implemented Google Analytics. <laughs> do, you, do you want to come up and give this? 12% <laughs> have not. Then we asked, of those, of that 88% uh, that are using Google Analytics, how many of them have implemented the privacy protection features that are um, uh, available in Google Analytics. I'm not asking this time. So, 85% um, uh, have, have implemented no privacy protection features that are, in, that are available in Google Analytics. 14% um, have implemented the Google IP anonymization feature. That's the blue wedge. Um, and only 1% have implemented the library to Google HTTPS uh, feature. Okay? And 0% had implemented both of those protection features, IP anonymization and um, HTTPS. So I think you'll agree those are, those are pretty, um, well, they're, they're, it, it's pretty stunning evidence that, that it shows that even though we care a lot about privacy, we're not really, we're not doing what we could pretty easily be doing to protect the privacy of our users. So Scott will now talk a little bit about recommendations that we make. Well, that was fun. We should do that every time. Kenny and I actually rehearsed that, so <laughs> thank you for being a part of that. So just to reiterate those five recommendations, this is within the context of Google Analytics. There's a lot more that we can do to protect our patrons' privacy, we know that. But within our context, this is, this is what we're asking uh, the community to do, implement HTTPS. This is a basic encryption protocol. Um, there are tools like OpenSSL and others that can help you implement HTTPS. Um, you know, work with your systems team, work with your digital librarians to get that done, or your UIT, your campus IT, if that's the situation. Um, and then if you want to run Google Analytics, or you currently are, um, uh, uh, IP anonymization. Um, that's just a one-line addition to the configuration snippet. Um, it's, it's pretty easy, you just have to know how to do it. So now you do. Um, <clears throat> user education, um, that's one of the things that we in libraries are really, really good at. Um, so um, leverage your outreach um, to talk with your communities about these matters. Um, and also your in-reach, um, talk with your staff um, so that you're also um, educated on privacy and the web. Um, informed consent from users, that's a really difficult one. There's this degrees of fully informed consent. But um, one thing that we recommend is cookie notices on library websites. This is common around the web. I'm sure you've seen dozens and dozens of them by now. But I, you probably haven't seen any on library websites. I haven't seen any on library websites. I'm not sure if libraries really do this, but we should. Um, we should tell our users how we're tracking them um, and, um, and how they can learn more and who they can contact. Um, even though we know that users don't necessarily read privacy policies and they just click those away, it's still something that should be there um, for the users that do want them to be there. Um, and then lastly, um, conducting a risk-benefit analysis um, when working with third-party vendors. Um, take the time to really look at what we're getting in return um, for the services that we're using. Um, are Google Analytics insights worth the cost, for example? Um, and then that risk-benefit analysis can be applied for any sort of contract or um, situation you may find yourself in where we're trading user data for services. Um, so those are our five recommendations. Um, And I just want to add a couple of things about how we did this, how we conducted this um, security audit. Um, we looked for, for HTTPS, we looked for the, the certificate um, in, in, 
in the library website and how that certificate was, was responding to both secure and insecure requests. Um, and then for the Google Analytics, we looked for uh, evidence of the Google tracking code um, or the Google Tag Manager uh, tracking code in the library websites. And that's how we came up with these uh, numbers. So this was research that was uh, generously funded by the Institute of Museum and Library Services, uh, part of a larger grant uh, that is closing out this month called Measuring Up. And again, there is the uh, citation for the publication uh, if you're interested in seeing the actual numbers and not just having me tell you, tell them. <laughs> um, so uh, a couple of uh, discussion prompts. I think we have a little bit of time. Um, this, this is clearly a, a thorny issue for us, right? We have these principles, we have these values about privacy. We're not quite living up to them. Um, and in the meantime, uh, we may be hindering ourselves by adhering too closely to those principles, right? We cannot, we cannot know our users very well or how they're behaving or what they need. Uh, if we don't have some sort of tracking mechanism. So it's, it's a difficult problem. But these are some of the questions that Scott and I thought might, might spur some conversation. So rather than going through them one by one, I, I would just open it up to uh, discussion. If you want to address one of these questions, um, feel free. Um, otherwise, we're happy to take questions.